Welcome to the Hillsdale Online Course Podcast. I'm Kyle. And I'm Juan. And we are back with our podcast on the Second World Wars. And we've already covered lectures one and two. Lecture one was Dr. Arn talking about the rising totalitarianism in Europe and the response to it. And then lecture two was Dr. Hansen talking about air power. Now we turn to the water. And the only experience that I have with naval strategy is the board game Battleship, uh, which I typically lose to uh, members of my family. Uh, but, but that term, that word, really dominates the thinking as we approach World War II. And the thought is that if you have the largest battleships, and those battleships can go and destroy the enemy naval fleets, then you're going to achieve naval supremacy. And that's the key to controlling the seas and ultimately winning the war. What Dr. Hansen does in a very interesting way is show how kind of our preceding theme, right, the theme of air power, changes that thinking. Yeah, one of the things, again, we uh, the, the word that I like to think of always keep in the back of my mind in this course is a strategy. So what was the strategy of the one side? What was the strategy of the other side? And, you know, Dr. Ar uh, Dr. Hansen, as he begins the lecture, he says that the Allies uh, prioritized the production of aircraft carriers while the Axis powers prioritized uh, the production of increasingly large and powerful battleships. And it's interesting because then you start combining the air power with the with the naval powers and you start seeing why the Allies started having the upper hand. And what you're seeing throughout this course is how the actual fighting, the actual war changes theory in massive ways. And this is probably one of the most interesting examples of that. Thank you for listening to our podcast. If you enjoy our content, I invite you to visit hillsdale.edu forward slash course. That's hillsdale.edu forward slash course, where you'll find over 40 courses on history, economics, literature, politics, and faith. And you will also find readings and quizzes and get a certificate if you complete our courses. That's hillsdale.edu forward slash course. And now here's Dr. Hansen. In the last lecture, we talked about the role of air power in World War II, but now let's look at the use of ships and navies. And the striking thing that at the beginning that, that we notice is that they're very similar in the sense that the war will be decided on the ground, not in the air and not on water, but maybe the ground war will be determined by what happens in the air or on water. And the same concepts reappear, that of supremacy and superiority and then parity. In other words, if you put assets, labor and capital and personnel out at sea and the other side has a navy or warships that are roughly comparable, then you've wasted your investment. They will fight against each other, but they will not alter the calculus on land. If your ships are more plentiful, or they're better designed, or they're the right ships, or they're better commanded and they're better operated, and you can destroy a great number of the enemy's naval assets, then you achieve naval superiority, which means you can operate against land forces without too much worry of enemy opposition. If you achieve naval supremacy, then you're free to do whatever you want globally on the seas. You can import, export food, you can land troops wherever you want them, you can bombard the shore uh, from naval batteries. So that was the point throughout the history of naval warfare is to achieve naval supremacy so you can use those assets on water to enhance the war on the ground, which will ultimately be the arbiter of who wins and who loses. When the war broke out in 1939, again, there was the continental power of Italy and Germany and their Eastern European allies, along with the collusion of the Soviet Union under the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. But the United States was 3,000 miles distant in the Atlantic from the theaters in Europe, and even more so in the Pacific from what was going on in Southeast Asia and China. And so the question was, if you're an Axis power and you have declared war on the United States, as happened in December of 1941, how do you reach it? If you don't have four-engine bombers that can bomb the mainland, do you have a mechanism to send a ship over that can either, what, bombard the shore? Well, that could, at best, that could be 
20 miles, but do you have an aircraft carrier that can send bombers they hit Detroit? Again, the answer is no. So in the case of relative naval strength, the war breaks out with some pretty stark realities. Number one, Italy, which has the largest navy after the collapse of the French navy in the Mediterranean, it has the largest navy in the Mediterranean, does not build a single aircraft carrier. Germany does not build a single aircraft carrier. It's almost analogous to their failure to achieve a four-engine bomber program. In other words, they do not have a mechanism to transmit naval power in a way that would hurt the mainland and the industrial center of their enemies in the United States or Russia or along Russian, Russia's coast or Great Britain. In contrast, the United States starts the war with six aircraft carriers, fleet carriers, that is larger or almost as large as 20,000 tons of displacement and above, and Britain has about seven. And more importantly, there's been a revolutionary change in thinking about naval power before the war starts that will see the United States create orders for more aircraft carriers than all of the navies combined in World War II. And Britain has the same change of thinking, at least on the drawing boards when the war breaks out. Now, the Axis have some advantages. Unlike air power, they haven't quite made the same catastrophic mistakes. They are captives to interwar naval thinking, which puts a great primacy on the battleship. According to the naval theories of the great strategist Alfred Mahan, the idea was that if you could destroy the enemy's warships at sea, then like a wolf among sheep, you could send a dreadnought or a battleship through an enemy convoy and just be unstoppable in your destruction. You could just fire salvo after salvo and nothing could stop you if you achieved naval superiority. So how did you obtain naval superiority? And the answer was, you build a battleship, and by 1939, they were pretty much standard in size because of arms limitation treaties in Washington and London. They were about 35,000 tons of displacement, oh, 800 feet long, somewhere around 2,000 to 2,500 men operated these ships, and they had guns, uh, maybe nine, maybe six, maybe somewhere in between of either 14-inch guns or 16-inch guns, and that meant they could fire a projectile about the size of a Volkswagen 20 to 22 miles. So the point of a battleship was to send your fleet surrounded by smaller heavy cruisers, light cruisers, destroyers, find the enemy, and according to the theories of Mahan, destroy the enemy's fleet. Mahan was very influential because in the Russian-Japanese War in 1905 at the Battle of Tsushima, the Japanese Navy had destroyed Russian battleships and cruisers and thereby was free to do whatever it wanted to the Russian merchant fleet, which was followed by an armistice and a de facto surrender on the part of the Tsar. At the Battle of Jutland in World War I, the German fleet actually went out in hopes that it could nullify the uh, British fleet. It did pretty well. It, it inflicted more damage than it suffered, but it did not destroy British naval uh, superiority, and therefore Britain was still able to uh, conduct a very effective blockade. But the thinking still was, if you want to obtain superiority and therefore export and import or blockade an enemy, you needed better battleships, you needed more of them, and you needed bigger and bigger calibers. This manifested itself, unfortunately, in the Axis idea with we're going to put a lot of investments. We can, instead of building 20 destroyers, we will build a 45,000 ton Bismarck and its sister ship, the Tirpitz. And you could build 20 destroyers for the, for the amount of money that went into the Bismarck or the Tirpitz. Or in the case of Japan, we, we can't build as many ships as the United States, but we'll build the Mushashi and the Yamato, 
which are the largest warships in the world at 70,000 tons, and they have, as no other battleship before or since has been able to pull off, they had 18-inch guns. So think of the, the rationale. The Yamoto and the Mushashi will sit off 24 miles from an American battleship fleet and bomb it at will, and their 16-inch guns will not be able to hit ours. They'll fall a mile or two short. And then when the war broke out, people were even envisioning a super battleship class in all of the belligerent navies that would have guns of 20 inches that could fire maybe 26 miles and beat an 18-inch battery of the opponent. Well, you can see where this is going. It means that certain navies are not being flexible and they're not being diversified. They're putting all of their scarce resources, or at least too many of their scarce resources, into bigger and fewer battleships. But the answer arises immediately, well, a battleship has a, a killing radius of about 20 or so miles, but if you have an asset like an aircraft carrier, and it has 90 fighters, dive bombers, torpedo planes, and they can fly two to 500 miles and turn around and land on that carrier, then you can increase your radius of lethality tenfold over a battleship. But because battleships were so majestic, they cut such a, an awesome spectacle on the sea and they were so invested in by the naval hierarchies, people didn't catch on when the war broke out to that reality. And so the history of naval power in 1939 to 1945 is simply a question of which navy will wise up and stop investing in battleships and divert that investment to aircraft carriers, submarines, destroyers that can attack merchant ships far more efficiently, or they can destroy other battleships uh, in the case of carriers with air power. And the answer was that Italy and Germany lost that war. They did not build an aircraft carrier, as I said, but their effort to build U-boats, as successful in the case of Germany it was, it was too little or too late. When the war broke out for all the vaunted U-boat reputation in Germany gained from World War I, it still only had about 60 U-boats that were operable in the Atlantic or the Mediterranean. So what was going to happen in World War II was which side would increase their number of carriers. Japan started the war with seven fleet carriers. The United States and the Pacific had only three, the Saratoga, the Lexington, and the Enterprise. However, we were able to bring the Hornet and the Wasp over, that made five, and then we put on order 27 X Essex carriers, each one of which were better than any aircraft carrier in the world, along with orders for additional, additionally battleships, cruisers, light cruisers, destroyers, and submarines that in their totality would be by 1944 larger than the German, the Italian, the Japanese, the Russian, and the British Navy put together. And so in the way of thinking among the Axis strategists, it was we started this war in the case of Germany without a very good Navy. We invested heavily in battleships and battle cruisers we don't have enough U-boats, and yet we're subject to a blockade, and that's gonna affect our strategy. We can go into Russia, perhaps, and get missing ore or food or fuel that we can't import, but if we're really gonna damage Britain and we can't bomb them because we don't have air supremacy, maybe we needed a Navy to stop importation to Britain through the Suez Canal and Gibraltar. And, the, and so they looked toward Italy, and in the case of America, they looked toward Japan. Germany tried to square the circle of not having aircraft carriers and realizing its mistake in the 1930s of investing too heavily in battleships by going on a breakneck pace to create U-boats. And the idea was, we've got to get not just 100 or 200 or 300, we've got to get 1,000 U-boats at sea and remember, they could go down to about 300 feet, and they had very su successful air compression, compressed air torpedoes, and they could attack in wolf packs. Uh, 
They were pretty adept at initially breaking British naval codes, and the idea was that they could destroy enough convoys coming from the British Empire, specifically Canada and Australia, South Africa, to feed and fuel Britain that it would give up even though they could not bomb it into submission. And one of the reasons that Hitler so unwisely declared war in the United States on December 11th was his U-boats commanders were telling him, you know, the Americans are really supplying Britain. And when our U-boats sit off the East Coast and they're in the Caribbean, they see these huge convoys the cities aren't even blacked out. You can see the neon lights of Miami or Newark or New York. And if we could just declare war on them, even though we only have 10 or 12 U-boats, we could get 50 or 60 and we could wipe out the U.S. merchant marine. And that had an undue influence on Hitler and was, explains the inexplicable why after Pearl Harbor he declared war in the United States. It looked like for a minute, just as in the case of the early failures of the U.S. strategic bombing campaign, that the Axis had the edge. So between January of 1942 and June of 1942, there was what they called a second happy time, a period in which U-boats had the technological edge, they had the strategic edge, and the United States really didn't listen to the British about the importance of convoy or didn't really know how sophisticated the British had become with radar and sonar. And then in their own turn, they really didn't understand how to use submarines, even though they had created a brilliantly designed Gato class, which will be followed by the Bello and Tench class submarines, which were the best in the world by 1944. But we didn't really know how to use them against Japan, much less put them in the Mediterranean with the British to attack Italian shipping. But in this period, what the Germans call the second happy time, they, at, for a brief moment, destroyed about 50% of all of the commerce and trade that going into the, the British Isles. And that was an unsustainable rate. And it looked like the U-boat camp campaign was going to be successful. But remember, World War II, as we said earlier, is a story of challenge, counter-challenge, response, counter-response. And so when the Allies looked at this unsustainable loss, they came up with a, a lot of solutions. One was they improved radar, they improved sonar, they got their hands on German naval codes through the so-called Ultra project, so they were able to predict where the Germans would be. They would be able to predict their tactics because they were reading their codes of attack. Most importantly, they developed a merchant marine building campaign on the so-called Liberty and Freedom ship where they were able to produce wonderful 10,000 displacement tonned merchant ships at the rate of about once every one every three days in the Oakland and Seattle shipyards. And so we sort of outbuilt the Germans' effort to destroy what we had in the merchant marines. And even at the, the greatest period of German success in destroying Allied shipping, we were creating more tonnage of merchant marine than they were attriting. A second thing that was going on, though, was when Germany decided that its battleship fleet was not obtaining results, it sent the Bismarck out in 1941 and it sent the Tirpitz out and some of its accompanying battle cruisers without air supremacy or even air superiority. And what happened was by May 1941, aircraft carriers were instrumental in sinking the Bismarck and the Tirpitz was relegated up to the fjords in Scandinavia and never played a substantial role. So there was a reminder to Hitler that even though you have created the best battleships in the world, there weren't enough of them and they were, were not aircraft carriers that could supply air protection and you did not coordinate your air on the continent to protect these ships at sea. And so we're, we're in a period of revolutionary activity in 1941. A couple of other examples. When the war broke out, the United States lost eight ships that were either sunk or submerged on battleship roll in Pearl Harbor. But these were mostly antiquated ships. They were slow. 
and the Japanese had not found our three carriers. So as dramatic and as grievous those wounds were on December 7th through two raids, and they were accomplished only by the use of six Japanese carriers, they attacked a fossilized or ossified asset. Not only were battleships not the wave of the future, but we had new and much better battleships and much faster on order. And so there were indications that the battleship already was obsolete. Another good example is on December, later, December 8th, in the subsequent week, the British sent their pride of their fleet, a battleship and the battleship cruiser Repulse into Singapore as if their magnificent 14 and 15 inch guns would so impress the Japanese that they might think twice about invading Singapore. And in fact, over 80 uh, Japanese bombers from Indochina bases destroyed both of those capital ships and reaffirmed the lesson learned at Pearl Harbor and learned in the Atlantic that a battleship or a battle cruiser without air superiority is almost helpless and that huge investment is wasted and is a reminder that you would have been better to build an aircraft carrier or a destroyer. And by, by that suggestion of a destroyer, I mean three or 400 destroyers rather than 10 or 12 battleships than invest in these sort of dinosaurs of the sea. Hillsdale College is a small, Christian, classical liberal arts college that operates independently of government funding. And we want you or your son or daughter to apply. At Hillsdale, students grow in heart and mind by studying timeless truths in a supportive community dedicated to the highest things. Hillsdale College costs significantly less than other nationally ranked private liberal arts colleges and receives regular recognition as a best value. And nearly all students receive financial aid. Our robust core curriculum, vibrant student life, an eight to one student to faculty ratio make for an education like no other. For more information or to fill out an application, visit hillsdale.edu backslash info. That's hillsdale.edu backslash info. If you look at the strategy then of naval fighting in World War II, it's pretty easy to understand. And it boils down to Germany thinks it's going to use its navy to blockade Britain and starve it out and then eliminate after June of 1940 the only enemy that's left. Remember, all of Europe, the present day EU is under occupation. Soviet Union has not been invaded yet. It's United States is isolationist, is not participating in the war. There's only Britain. The air war, the so-called Blitz, has failed to bring uh, Britain to its knees. The surface campaign of using the Bismarck or the Graf C or the Prince Eugen to go out and get into the middle of a convoy has failed. The ships have either been sunk or they're confined to their ports. The U-boat campaign looks like it for a while it might work and then British technology and know-how has nullified it. And so what's left as far as the German Navy? And the answer is not much at all. After 1943, the U-boats are pretty much impotent. They're being destroyed at a faster rate than they're being produced. There is no longer a German surface fleet. And Germany's great hope in the Italian fleet in the Mediterranean has sort of been dashed. Remember, the Italians, uh, after the destruction of free France, that is, in June of 1940, the wonderful French fleet, the third large, fourth largest fleet in the world, has now been neutralized. It's confined to ports in North Africa. The British are forced to destroy it. And for a brief moment, Mussolini has six battleships, 20 cruisers. He has naval superiority inside the Mediterranean. Hitler is suggesting to him, you, if you just take Malta, we took Crete, we can then go into Gibraltar, maybe we can flip Franco and have the Spanish help us. Then we can unleash Rommel, he might get to the Egyptian border, go all the way to Suez, and we would have 
the Mediterranean as, a, as an axis lake, and we could cut off all importation of strategic materials from the Middle East and elsewhere through the Suez Canal to Britain. The problem, of course, is that Italy has surface ships, and the surface ships are not like British surface ships. They don't have a night capability to fire effectively at night, they don't have radar, and they don't have crews and training and admirals like the British do. In a series of battles uh, between 19, early 1940 and 42, the Italian fleet is either destroyed or confined to its ports. At that point, there is no longer an Axis naval war after 1943. If you're a German submariner or you're in an Italian destroyer and you go out on the Mediterranean, a British ship is going to sink you or a British base bomber is going to destroy you. If you're in the Atlantic after 1943, you are going to have no success attacking a convoy and you're probably going to eventually be sunk. At the end of the war, about 75% of the German U-boat fleet, which translates into about 40,000 German sailors are gonna die. And yet, that was a great hope of uh, Germany's naval efforts in World War II. To sum up, if we were to look at World War II on water around 1944, let's say around November, there is no naval warfare. The British and American fleets have absolute, not naval superiority, but naval supremacy. They can land ships and troops and ports. Uh, they can build anywhere they want in North Africa. They can land troops in Italy. And on D-Day, the Germans can't even put a credible naval force to stop some 7,000 ships of various sizes and sorts are gonna land troops on Normandy and they're subject to an economic blockade. And that's what Mahan had originally suggested in his theories of naval su supremacy. In other words, once you have control of the water, you can affect the course of fighting on land. And that's what happened in Europe in 1944. There was a little bit more trouble in the Pacific theater for a variety of reasons. When the war breaks out, Japan had the third largest navy in the world, but most importantly, it had the second largest carrier fleet. In some ways, if you count all classifications of carriers, it was superior to the British carrier fleet. And more importantly, it, its bases in the greater, uh, co the greater East uh, Asia co-prosperity sphere were much more conducive to Pacific warfare than was Pearl Harbor or San Diego or London. In other words, at Rabaul or Truk or Singapore, or Manila after Japan had taken these key American and British bases, the Japanese Navy was gonna be very hard to get out because of questions of supply and logistics. You had to send an American fleet to save Australia all the way to Guadalcanal, or you had to send them beyond Hawaii to Midway, or you had to send them all the way off the coast of New Guinea to the Coral Sea, and yet, the Japanese fleet was based in these rings of defense in the Pacific that made their logistic challenges much easier. And so the question, the ultimate question of naval warfare in the Pacific would be, can the United States destroy these six or seven fleet carriers and can they destroy the means of production in Japan so they can't build more while themselves creating a vast new carrier fleet. And by 1943, the answer is getting very close to uh, resolution. In other words, if you count an escort carrier, which is about 7,000, 8,000, 9,000 tons, it's a brilliant idea of taking a light cruiser hull, putting a flat landing platform on it and putting 60 planes, many of them still good, but have been superseded by more advanced models. And you build, say, 100 of them, and then you have light carriers of 15 to 20,000 tons, and they can carry maybe 70 or 80 planes. And then you have fleet carriers of 30,000 tons, and they can hold maybe 100 planes, and you build 145 of these carriers, and each of them has a range of about 500 miles, then you can achieve naval superiority 
At the same time, you're unleashing a submarine campaign against Japanese commerce. You're, you, you're trying to bomb Japan from February of 1945, and therefore you're gonna stop the ability of the Japanese to build carriers. They only build about six, five or six fleet carriers in World War II, where we build 27, and they hardly build any light or escort carriers as well. So the story is that the United States starts World War II with losing its battleship fleet at Pearl Harbor, and it's kind of privately relieved. They think if those ships had been at sea, they were slow, they were of World War I vintage, we could have lost 15, 16,000 trained sailors. Thank God they were here. And more importantly, we have a, uh, a new class of battleship about 10 or 12 so-called fast battleships, the North Dakota, and eventually the Maryland, the California, but eventually we're gonna have these four battleships of the Iowa class. And the result is, instead of going 22 knots or 23 knots, they're gonna go 30 knots or 35 knots. They're all gonna have 16-inch guns. They're gonna have a high uh, precision, high-caliber uh, high barrels so that they can shoot a 16-inch projectile about 22 miles, and they can do so with more accuracy than a Japanese battleship. And most importantly, we're going to use these battleships in an innovative way that had not been true of Europe or even the Japanese. In other words, we're going to get to Japan by island hopping. We're going to go through two routes. We're gonna go through New Guinea to the Philippines under MacArthur and the Army, largely Army divisions, and then Nimitz, uh, and the Marines will go to truck, they're going to go to Peleliu, they're going to go to Iwo Jima, Okinawa, the Mariana Islands. And as they do so, we're going to use these battleships to pull up alongside these islands and use these enormously uh, lethal barrels, not against other battleship, but to pound Japanese installations on the island. And we have with the resurrected battleships, four of them that were lost at Pearl Harbor and the 12 that we that built during the war, we're going to have 16 battleships, about 45 heavy cruisers that have eight inch guns, another 20 or 30 light cruisers that have six inch guns, and we're gonna build the largest number of destroyers in the world, almost 400 of them with three and four inch guns. And the result will be each time we target an island, not only will Japanese submarines not be able to get within the rings of protections of the destroyers, light cruisers, cruisers, battleship carriers, but hand in glove with the carriers, the battleships will pound uh, the coral installations and reinforce concrete bunkers of the Japanese, and the carriers will sit there and pound them with constant air sorties. Again, predicated on the idea of achieving naval superiority and destroying the Japanese fleet. How then did the United States and Britain achieve naval superiority in the Pacific? And the answer is multifold. The first thing to remember is that, as we discussed earlier, the naval war against the Germans and the Italians is essentially over in mid-1943. Italy is knocked out of the war by all for all practical purposes in June and July of 1943, and its fleet is confined to its harbors. Germany, to the degree it has a uh, surface fleet, it's either in hiding or it's damaged, it's in dry dock. Its U-boat fleet, while there are still U-boats, two or 300 active, they're isolated, their codes have been broken, and technologically they have lost the race to evade British detection or American detection. What that meant in the Pacific was that each time a British shipyard or an American shipyard built a transport ship or built a submarine or a destroyer or a cruiser or a battleship or a carrier, there was no longer a European first idea, Pacific second. It was, we've kind of bifurcated our assets. So tanks, artillery, army divisions, they tend to go to Europe. Most of the strategic bombers go to Europe, but now we're free because there's not really a worry about an Italian and German Navy to shift all of our assets, literally, carriers and battleships, uh, 
within, in the American case, to the Pacific. And that was coupled with an enormous increase in American shipbuilding. And so we're flooding the Pacific with American merchant ships, and they are being escorted by three to 400 destroyers. And we have a fleet of over 200 submarines that are operating out of Pearl Harbor. And the result of it is then we're bringing naval assets to, to the Pacific from the Atlantic theater, or when we build new ones, we no longer think that we have to divert very many to Europe. So it's pretty much a war of Japan versus the entire naval uh, potential of the United States and to a lesser extent of Great Britain. Second thing to remember is that there is a technological revolution going on. And while a carrier is a static asset, in other words, when you build the Lexington or the Saratoga or the Enterprise, they can't be radically improved too much because they're already built and they're at sea, it's not like having a battleship. Once you have a 16-inch gun, you're stuck with a 16-inch gun. You can maybe get a, a different size powder charge, but you're stuck with it. Once you have a carrier, you're not stuck with the airplane. And what's happening between 42 and 45 is that the Japanese are not investing in pilot training, and they don't have the fuel to conduct uh, training missions, but most importantly, the best fighter in the world, you could argue, was the Model Zero, the Mitsubishi Zero, which was the terror of the skies over China and Southeast Asia in 1939 and 40, superior to the American P-39 or P-40 or Wildcat, but not so true by 1943, so in 1944. So when these new fleet carriers, the Essex class, come online, they are better than their Japanese counterparts. In fact, they're much better than earlier carriers as defined by the length of the deck, fire fighting technique, speed, reliability. But most importantly, they have a different type of airplane now. And we have learned to put, and not a, well, a wildcat, we have the ability to put a hellcat so what does that mean? It means the speed of an American fighter craft on an aircraft deck is no longer 270 miles, but it's nearly 400 miles an hour. And it's no longer carrying three or four or five machine guns, but maybe eight. And it no longer has a range of 250 miles, but maybe five or six or 700 miles. And it no longer has a coffin like plane, the Devastator torpedo bomber, that can only go about 100 miles an hour with a torpedo, but it has an Avenger torpedo bomber with twice the range and twice the speed. And the same thing is through the Dauntless dive bomber versus the new Helldiver dive bomber. So what's happened in this revolution is suddenly the carriers are all over the Pacific, but their lethal arm, their air arm, has been reinvented as something that is, is just so superior to the Japanese that any time a Japanese carrier encounters an American carrier, it's gonna lose. And you can see it in the progression of naval battles. So take after Pearl Harbor, uh, in the first six months, when the Japanese have superior planes and they have six carriers and we only have three that are operable, for the first six months, the kill ratio off Singapore, if you count Pearl Harbor or battles in the Java Sea or on the Indian Ocean is about 20 Japanese. Uh, the Japanese kill about 20 Allied sailors to every one they lose. And in terms of tonnage, it's about 30 to one. And then something happens. Americans start to produce more planes, better pilots, and they have better commanders. So for all of the vaunted reputation of Admiral Yamamoto, he did not order a, a third strike at Pearl Harbor, which might have knocked out the oil production. He did not order his carriers after the Battle of Coral Sea to pursue and destroy the United States fleet. He split his forces at Midway. The United States Admiralty is not making those mistakes. Japanese admirals, for supposedly being so audacious and risk takers, they understand they have a static fleet. And when they lose a carrier, they're not gonna get it replaced easily. So they become very timid. By the opposite token, the Americans become very, very 
aggressive and risk-taking because they know they're going to have more and more carriers to replace any that are lost. At the first battle, of the major battle at Coral Sea in May of 1942, the Americans get a draw, which is pretty incredible, just six months after Pearl Harbor, after all of these devastating losses at sea that the Allies have incurred, they sink a Japanese carrier and they damage another Japanese carrier, the Sokaku. And then they lose the Lexington, but the Yorktown is allowed to escape. It limps home to Pearl Harbor. And then a wondrous thing happened that's reflective of the, of the entire dilemma for the Japanese Imperial fleet. Whereas the Yorktown is almost sunk, it goes into Pearl Harbor and then within 72 hours, they literally shut down the power grid of Honolulu and rebuild the carrier at least enough to get out to sea. But Japan takes its damaged carrier and puts it in Yokohama for six months. It doesn't replace the air crews. So you can see that there's subtleties to naval warfare that we really don't pay attention to. How big is your maintenance crew? How big is your training crew? How good is your decision making at the admiralty level? And the United States is starting to see that with Halsey and Spruance and Nimitz and Ernest King at the chief of naval operation, we have a vaunted advantage. The next great battle at Midway, we still only have uh, the Enterprise and the Hornet, but we somehow get the Yorktown back that the Japanese are think is sunk. Meanwhile, the Japanese, they're two great fleet carriers. One has lost too many planes at Coral Sea, the other was damaged. They're in, they're in port, so the advantage is not so great. It's now four Japanese carriers against three American carriers. Even though the Japanese have perhaps better planes, more carriers, and more subsidiary ships, they cannot take the island of Midway. In a devastating series of reverses, the American fleet will destroy all four of the Japanese fleet carriers at Midway. And at that point, you can make the argument that Japan no longer has naval superiority in the Pacific. It, it doesn't have, the Americans don't have superiority themselves. It's more like parity. But in the long term, you can see that the trends will not be good for the Japanese because we're training more planes. We're gonna eventually send over 100,000 planes. Think of it, 100,000 planes to the Pacific to be based at bases and on carriers. The Japanese in this time frame will build about 10,000 for carrier and uh, land-based operations. And so in 1942, you're starting to see a change. And then in five key naval battles in succession in the fall of 1943, off Guadalcanal into 43, the Americans will essentially, even though they will lose two more carriers, and with the Lexington gone and the Yorktown gone and the Hornet will be sunk and the Wasp will be sunk for, and the Saratoga will be torpedoed for a brief moment, the Japanese are excited that only the Enterprise seems to be out there and it's wounded. What they don't quite understand is, as I said, there's 27 Essex carriers that are now going to start to appear. But in comp recompense for that, they have lost uh, a number of cruisers, they have lost a light carrier, they have lost a number of destroyers, and they've lost Guadalcanal. As 1943 starts, the American submarine fleet fixes its torpedo problems, it gets new classes of submarines, it's allowed to venture further and further from Pearl Harbor, and you're going to start to see the effect of these tactics, these new ships, and especially new uh, Hellcat fighters, Avengers, and Helldiver dive bombers. And in a series of battles in 44 off the Mariana Islands, we know it as the Great Mariana Turkey Shoot, and then at Leyte Gulf off the Philippines, the United States uh, Navy will basically destroy all of the naval air capability of the Japanese Imperial Fleet. And a series of submarine attacks and air attacks, by the end of 1944, the Imperial Navy is rendered combat ineffective. Now, what does that mean? That means while there's still a few submarines, it means that Every time the U.S. Marines and Army decide to take an island, there's not going to be a Japanese plane appearing out of the skies to bomb 
a transport ship, an amphibious ship. When Americans land at Iwo Jima or Okinawa, they're not going to be strafed by Japanese planes. And their only resort will be, as we discussed earlier, a desperate attempt to revive a naval arm or even an air arm through kamikaze. But it will mean that the United States can supply oil, munitions, and repair parts anywhere it wants in the Pacific. And it will start to, as in the case of an onion, peel away layer after layer after layer of the Japanese empire. And it will do so by fighting a war completely different than what it fought in Europe. And this is really important to understand the calculus of World War II. We get caught up in this notion of, well, we, we diverted 70% of our material and our labor to Europe because Hitler was deemed the greater threat, and then we shorted the Pacific War. And it, it wasn't that simple. As nobody in, in their right mind understood the capabilities of the U.S. economy. At the end of the war, in terms of gross domestic product, the United States is producing more goods and services than Russia, Japan, the defunct Italians, the Germans, and the British Empire combined. And what that means is that they are able to conduct two wars simultaneously through the greater industrial production of all their enemies and allies combined. And more importantly, they tend to be complementary rather than antithetical. By that I mean when you build a tank, you, you can send some to the Pacific, but you usually send it to Europe. When you build 105 or 155 uh, millimeter Horowitz, a howitzer or gun, you send it to the, Europe. If you have a P-51 or a P-47 or a B-17, you use it more in Europe. Same is true of the B-24. However, if you're building submarines, if you're building cruisers, destroyers, battleships, carriers, carrier craft like the Hellcat fighter or the Corsair marine fighter, you can direct, or the B-29 heavy bomber, you direct all of that to the Pacific. And because Britain at the same time is fighting in Burma and trying to protect India, and because of the demise of the Italian and German fleet, Britain is doing the same thing. It's sending its carrier and battleship fleet to the Pacific, and this reaches a crescendo, as I said, in early 1945, where the Japanese Imperial Fleet has disappeared from the Pacific, as large as it is, as formidable as it is, it's a, it's a huge, vast ocean. But by mid-1945, the American fleet can do what it wants. It can supply, it can deploy wherever it wants. And the hope of the Japanese war effort itself, that is the Japanese Imperial Fleet, the dream of Admiral Yamamoto is now dashed, and it will be simply a question of whether the fleet, as in the case of the air arm, will be so superior to the Japanese, whether it will, be, it will preclude a land engagement altogether. So far we've talked about air power and naval power in terms of redirecting fighting on the ground up into the air at sea, on the premise that if you were able to achieve first superiority and second supremacy, then those theaters could be redirected to the ground. That is, you could use ships to attack or ground forces or to augment or enhance ground forces, or you could do the same with planes. But central to that argument is the ground is where the action is. The ground is where the war will be won or lost. In our next lecture, we're gonna see why that is so and why the Allies were able to defeat Germany and Italy and Japan on the ground. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Hillsdale Online Courses podcast. If you want to continue learning about World War II or other topics, please visit hillsdale.edu forward slash course. There you can find over 40 free online courses, including American Citizenship and Its Decline with Victor Davis Hansen, C.S. Lewis on Christianity, Ancient Christianity, the rise and fall of the Roman Republic, and many more. The courses include additional readings, study guides, fully produced videos, and you can chat with your fellow students on a dedicated forum. Upon completing a course, you will also get a certificate. All our courses are free because we believe that a virtuous citizen is the best defense for liberty. So pursue the education necessary for freedom and happiness 
at hillsdale.edu slash course today. That's hillsdale.edu slash course. Thanks for listening.